Good morning, everyone. All right, so some good news. Well, almost good news. Uh, so the assignment three server is up. Yay. Uh, you all have accounts on that server. I just haven't sent you your username and passwords quite yet. Uh, I have them all. I was doing that, and I was almost made me late to my class this morning. So uh, as soon as I'm done with this, you'll get an email with your username and password for the homework three site and how to access the homework three site. Uh, so homework three, I'll also send a write up. So you all have accounts on this server. There are a bunch of you. Anybody who requested to be obfuscated has a numeric thing, the zero underscore. Um, so you'll all have accounts on here. Um, the goal is there are a series in uh, slash var. There's a challenge folder, uh, which you can't actually access directly. In each of that, there's a subdirectory for each of the challenges. Oh, that's I thought it was uh, evacuate the building thing. Okay, so on the server, in slash var slash challenge in that directory, there's a number of folders, challenge one through challenge 15. So each of these challenges is one challenge, uh, one level, you have to break one level before you get to the next level. So for instance, uh, if I look at my ID, we can see that my group, I'm in the group Adam D and the group level one, which means that I can LS var challenge level one because what are the permissions on this directory? Yeah, so challenge, the creator of this directory, can read, write, execute. Um, but level one, the people in the group level one can read and execute. Right? And then inside here, there's a binary called level one. So what are the permissions on this guy? What was it? Read, write, execute for challenge. What's the S? Sticky set UID or set group ID in this case. It's on the group ID bits. Right. So what does that mean? What is this one program when I run it? What's it going to run as? As root? As what? Level one. As challenge? As level one. As level two. As level two. Why level two? The group, so it's going to specifically run as the group level two, right? The set UID bit does not necessarily mean it's going to run as root, right? Here, the set UID bit is on the group execute bit, which it means that you get inherit the group permissions of the owner of that file. So this means when you execute it, it's as if you had group level two permissions. Uh, challenge, so there is no set UID on challenge, so it's not going to run as challenge. It's going to run as you, the user. If there was an S on challenge execute bit, then it would be running as the user challenge. So, I don't know, I'm not gonna tell you how it does. Uh, I'll clear. Okay, uh, so your goal, you have to figure out how to do that. Uh, you can look at how everybody is doing with the score command. So that shows you at what level everyone is at. Uh, so then once you break that level, you go up to the next one. Uh, there's a nice helper func uh, command called delete function, which is when you break a program, right? So once you break that set UID program, you call this delete function to set your group to that group. So that gives you that permissions of that level two group. And that's how you add yourself to that next group. Questions so far? So is this pretty much a clone of like smash the stack or uh It's similar, yeah. So you can see all the challenges in here, level one, level two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, yeah, they're similar in style, different in substance. These are supposed to be a little bit easier, right? Um, but they get harder. So some of them you'll have source code to, some of them you will not have source code to, so you know, do responsibly, uh, do it what you need to do. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, so some important, important comments, right? So, 
So A, there's how many of us in this class? Anybody know? 123, right? It's a decently big server. I don't know, it's eight, eight cores with, what is it, 16 gigs of memory, so I figured that was fine. We'll see how it goes. I may have to split some of you off into another server. Hopefully I don't have to do that, but um, I think it should be fine. So, you know, brute forcing things, I'm pretty sure none of the levels are, have to do with brute forcing. So yeah. Do we have a coding directory, like a temp directory or something like that? Uh, you have your own home directory, and yeah, they're just temp directories, I believe. Yeah. Um, so A, you know, be mindful of the resources on the system, right? Don't be hogging all the resources. Uh, B, so this is actually a very important one. So while I want you to have fun, and if you want to try to attack the server, I'm fine with that. But only this machine. So this is running inside our um, uh, OpenStack cloud for my lab, right? And so I've tried to restrict it so you can't access any of those servers, but inside because there's experiments running and all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, so we've, we're not assuming that there's malicious internal cloud traffic in our lab network, so don't do anything malicious on the internal of the network. Does that make sense? So you can totally attack this machine on it. You can try whatever, I don't know, if there's any root exploits or whatever, but only on this machine. Don't end map other machines in the network or try to sniff traffic or anything like that because that's definitely out of bounds. Cool. Um, okay, I think as far as safety, that kind of stuff, ground rules, uh, that's, so you'll have to, for each, so what you'll turn in is you'll submit the, uh, or. You know, I'll be able to tell exactly how you did based on where your score is on this thing. Um, and then you'll have to submit a readme of exactly how you broke each of the levels, right? So as you're doing this, keep a walkthrough for each level of exactly how you did it and the command, you know, hey, this is how I broke this level so that you can do it again and so that we can know that you actually did it. Questions? Move. I have to give you the logins after I talk about it, because then otherwise you'd all just do that instead of listening to lecture. <laughs> Only slightly correct. Okay. Cool. Um, I don't know. I think you'll enjoy it. Because we're, it's uh, essentially you're going to be applying all the stuff, all the attacks, binary attacks we've been talking about. So you have to, you know, uh, one of my big philosophies is uh, understanding how vulnerability works is, you know, good, it's the first step, right? But actually creating one that works on a real program, on a real system is uh, something else entirely. So it gives you a lot better understanding of that vulnerability. Okay, so we've been talking about, right now we're going through <coughs> talking about the stack and we're talking about how the layout looks of the stack because we want to try to understand buffer overflow vulnerabilities, right? And what they can do. Um, so. I'm going to, I want to get through all this stuff today, so I'm going to go a little bit quickly because this is kind of background-ish material. Um, this is, so like I mentioned, this is stuff that I teach in my 340 class, so if you're taking 340 with me, you should be a total expert on this. Okay, so functions, right, they need space to allocate for their local variables, right, and so, um, we want to use the stack, right? So we want to use the stack to store each of the local variables on the function, right? Uh, and so we saw the stack, right? We saw that it moves and we can push things on and pop things off, right? And so we want to use the stack for, uh, for storing these local variables of our function. But as our function executes, right, what's going to happen to the stack pointer? So ESP, right, is going to store the location of the stack in memory. So as our function executes, what can happen to the stack pointer? Stack could go up and down depending on things being pushed, things being popped. Uh, the stack's used if there's, if you're doing computation that requires uh, that's more computation than you have registers, some of the registers will spill over onto the stack. So the stack will be changing based on that. Uh, so. While we could use the stack pointer, so we'd say, okay, every local variable is some offset of the stack pointer, 
the stack pointer is going to be changing throughout the execution of our function. Um, so we introduce a separate concept, which we're going to have a frame pointer, or in x86 terminology, it's called the base pointer. So the base pointer is going to point to a fixed location for each function invocation. So every function invocation, and that's going to define the function frame on the stack. And this way, every local variable is going to be some offset from this base pointer. Right? And that's exactly how local variables are implemented in functions. Right? An important concept is that there, you can have multiple invocations of the same function on the stack at once. Right? That's how we have recursion. And so because of this, every different function frame is going to have its own base pointer. And they'll all be at different memory locations. Um, and so in x86, the frame pointer is the base pointer, and it's stored in the register EVP. So let's look what this looks like. So we have a C program. We have variables A, B, and C. We have A is equal to 10, B is equal to 100, C is equal to 10.45, and A is equal to A plus B, and we're returning zero. So what the compiler does is it, the compiler looks and sees what local variables we're using in this scope, and then it's just going to define every local variable as some offset of the base pointer. You know, it just decides. Right? It knows exactly how many variables are being used, right? so it knows exactly the size that it needs to reserve, and then it can know, for it assigns to each variable some offset. So it can say that, okay, variable A is at EVP plus A, B is at EVP plus B, C is at EVP plus C. And so looking at this code, right, translating this into kind of pseudo assembly, this would be something like the memory of EVP plus A Right, so that offset is equal to 10. And that's what this instruction does. And the next instruction is going to be EVP plus B, the offset B, is equal to 100. And this is EVP plus C is equal to 10.45. And then finally, we're going to say, OK, the memory of EVP plus A is equal to EVP plus A plus EVP plus B. And so what it does is then, uh, it, so it, you know, assigns actual concrete values to these. So it could be 4, 8, and 7, and C. And specifically, as we'll look at on x86, the local variables are going to be below the base pointer. So they're referenced with negative, uh, you know, negative offsets here, whereas parameters are going to be positive offsets. So we'll see this specifically. Uh, so it's going to look something like this. So it's going to say move. Uh, the stack pointer into, oh, so this is actually this function compiled into x86. Uh, so we'll see this function prolog, this will come up later. So we're first moving the stack pointer into the base pointer. So now whatever was in the base pointer is now going to be pointing to the stack pointer. Yes. Okay. And then we're, uh, so now the base pointer points to where the current location of the stack is. Now we're subtracting the 10, uh, we're subtracting the stack pointer down 10 in hex, so down 16 bytes. So the base pointer is going to be where the stack pointer originally was, and the stack pointer is going to be down 16 bytes. So now by moving it down, it's essentially allocated 16 bytes for our program to use. So that, that way, at base pointer minus C, that's where variable A is. And so it says move hex A, which is 10, into EVP minus C, and then move hex 64 into EVP minus 8, which is not quite as far as C, and that's where B lives, and then it's going to move uh, 41273333, as we all know 10.45 is in IEEE floating port format, right? Uh, then we're going to move EAX into EVP minus 4, which is the location of C. So why does it do this? So what's the effect there? Those two statements, what's the ultimate uh, outcome of those two statements, those last two move instructions? Yeah. So the floats, they are two byte characters, uh, the four bytes. What are we doing there? 
will go by to you when register like what can be PA and then what? And then putting that four bytes again into uh, that memory location. Yeah, exactly. Right? So yeah, so into EBP minus four, and EBP minus four is the location of C. You know that C in the C program was originally a float. Right? So those two instructions are just take that constant value and move it into EBP minus four. Why it uses that register EAX, I honestly don't know off the top. I don't know why it's the only reason I can give is compilers. Uh, so it's some kind of compiler optimization. Either the instruction was less to do it in two steps like this, or maybe it's faster. Uh, one of those two options. Okay. Uh, then the last thing we're gonna do, so this takes care of oops, this takes care of these three instructions. Now we need to do the addition. So we're gonna first move EBP minus eight into EAX, and EBP minus eight is hex eight, or is a B. So we move the variable B into EAX, then we add EAX to EBP minus C, and the add, remember, takes the first parameter, adds it to the second parameter, and where does it store it? Actually, the way I remember, especially when we have an example like this, is I look for the constants. Right, like here, subtract 10 ESP. So what's this doing? Subtracting 10 from what? From the second. ESP from the second one, and then where's it storing it? Is it storing it into 10? No, it doesn't make sense, right? It has to store it in the second one. So that's how that subtraction works, and works the same way. So it takes e <coughs> EAX, which is uh, B, it says add it to what's ever in EBP minus C, which is A, and then store that back into A. So that, in effect, does both of those. Okay, so let's visualize this. Let's see how this looks. So we have that code we just looked at, looked at on the right. Uh, we have our awesome stack, right, high to low. Uh, it's at some stack pointer when we start, right? We don't know exactly where it is. Every function invocation can be different, depending on our program. Even the same function invocation run, ran different times as we saw, right? The environment will shift our stack, and so our stack can change based on just where our program is from. So let's say we have 10,000, and now we have our registers EAX, ESP, and EBX. So these are the only ones that are used here. Uh, so first, originally, so we're saying, okay, the stack is originally going to be at 10,000 hex. And so this first <coughs> instruction is going to move the value inside ESP into EBP, right? So that's gonna move that there. And then we're gonna subtract 16, hex 10 from ESP. So it's gonna be FFF0. And then that's gonna move the stack down now, right? But where's EBP pointing to? Yeah, the original 10, 16 bytes up, the original location of ESP. Right, so this is why, while this function executes, the stack pointer can change, but the base pointer is gonna remain fixed for this invocation of this function. And so this proceeds just as we saw. So it's gonna move 10 into EBP, so remember this syntax here says, take the value of ES EBP, right, subtract C from it, which is 12. Yep. Yes, 10, 11, 12. Uh, 12, which is going to be some offset down here. So if these are four bytes, it'll be what? One, two, three here. Then it will say, okay, move 10 into there, into that memory location. So the important things here are this offset, the negative hex C, that, whatever it is, is added to EBP, and then it's dereferenced. So the parentheses are dereferenced. Uh, so that's going to be, so I have all the addresses here. So that's going to put a right here, so 12 bytes down from e EBP is going to be the value, constant value A. Then we have the same thing, so EBP minus 8 is FFF8, and we're going to move the constant value hex 64 into there. Then we're going to move uh, this crazy, the IEEE floating forward representation of 10.45, we're going to move this into EAX. 
And then we're going to move this into EVP minus 4. EVP minus 4 is FFFC. Right, so that value is going to be there. And then finally, we're going to move EVP minus 8. So the memory at EVP minus 8, which is it, hex A, we're going to move that into EAX. Or, ah, yes. Good, 64. See, I was just checking this to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> so, and we can see on here, right, that A is here, right, B is here, and C is here. And this is how they are laid out on the stack. And we know that because we can look at this x86 code and we can match it to the C code and say, hey, look, you know, I know that I set A into, I set hex A into the integer A. So then I know from here I'm moving the constant A into EVP minus C. That means in this function, EVP minus C is the variable A in the original program. Okay, so then we move uh, 60, hex 64 into there, and then we add, now we're gonna take EAX, right, hex 64, add it with EVP minus C. Uh, anybody know what that is? Any hex additions? Be 110, right? Isn't that what they are? 110. So 110, which six e. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we've done this program. We stepped through and we've seen exactly how the stack is being used for this function frame. So the idea here is that this this function, which I can't remember what we <coughs> called it, blue or main. I think it was main. Right. It owns essentially this memory location. And this is how it's storing the local variables of the function. Uh, questions on this example? Mm -hmm. so, so the second step we subtracted 10 from the stack pointer. Yes. So why is the constant 10? Like, ah. Does it depend on the size of the program? Like, that's why we are subtracting a constant 10? Not necessarily the program. It does depend on the program. Yes. So the compiler looks and it says, how much memory do I need for the local variable? Right, so that's why the compiler knows the exact, so in C, this is why for performance reasons, right, and probably a host of others, uh, you know exactly, you have the size of operator that can tell you exactly how many bytes every type uses in your program. So this way the compiler can tell for this function, it knows all the local variables that are declared. So it can look and see, okay, what's the type of each of these local variables, so how many bytes do I need to store these here? And then so it'll determine, so here it was what, 12, right, 12 bytes. But then why does it move 16 now? The return address? The return address? We haven't oh, seen the return address yet. Yeah, return value. We'll see that. Let's see that. Oh, our return value. Uh, did we talk about C decal? Wait a second. Did we talk about C decal yet? Maybe we'll get to that now. Okay, we'll see. The return value is actually put into EAX. So the register EAX is used for return values. And what is the program is dynamic? Like we are allocating, we are making a dynamic program. That With the uh, malloc? Yeah, the malloc or like we are making some dynamic program with the user pointer. Like, so how do we do this type of thing? Right, so kind of as we saw, so we're just looking right now at the stack, at stack allocation, right? Uh, so on the ELF, right, you have the stack that's growing down. And below that, you have the heap that's growing up. So all the malloc is happening on the heap, right? Which is something completely different, which we're not worrying about now. Uh, but you actually can't, this is why in C, you can't write an array that has a variable length, like a stack allocation of a variable length array, right? You have to use malloc in order to dynamically create that because the compiler must reserve the space for you like this. So why 16 and not 12? Because we'd be able to binary, I like that. Yeah. It's probably convenient because it's a byte, and so it probably does it in byte in 16 increments of 16. Yeah, so it actually goes back to the, it's 
the original compound answer. It's compilers. The compiler decided that this is the optimal way to do it based on its knowledge of offsets. Uh, because on some systems, if you're not addressing bytes based on an offset, you can actually get a seg fault for some type of, a, of an exception. Um, so that's basically why. So it decides, the compiler people have done hopefully the measurements or whatever to say, hey, even though we're technically using more memory, right, it's actually faster to use that because it's byte aligned. Exactly. So it is because it's a, I think it's even a power four aligned. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, the other is storing the offsets on the three to eight. Uh, We're storing. What do you mean? So when the compiler sees minus zero x p mm -hmm. or the dpp, mm -hmm. why are we having offsets not the actual memory? Ah, because this is a function, right? The function can be executed anywhere. We don't know exactly where it's going to be when it executes. But we know that that stack pointer, when it executes, is going to be at memory we can use. We know we can move the stack pointer down to get more memory, right? So that's exactly what we do is we say, OK, then I'm going to use this stack. This part of the stack is mine, and I'm going to use it. So you know, the fact that it had what was it, A at minus C and B at minus 8, that's just a compiler decision. It could have swapped those. But the important point is that it compiles it like this. Right, so that's constant. Every time in the original program you reference A, here you reference EDP minus C. Yeah. This offset is to issue a pop command, would it pop the value of A or? If you issue a pop command, it'll pop whatever's in FFF0. Because that's, so pop is take that value in there, put it into somewhere else, and then move that pointer, that uh, increment ESP. So because ESP here is pointing actually not even at A, it won't. Don't put the garbage somewhere. If you are the programmer, you don't like you would expect a pop to produce a like the compiler should. Ah program. no! If you're the programmer, if you try to do a pop, right? So you're trying to do x86 instructions. Yeah. You have absolutely no idea what the stack is going to be at that point, right? Unless you actually put something on the stack. So because you, as a programmer, you can't make any assumptions about what's on the stack, right? There's nothing in the C standard that says this is exactly how it has to go. This is just how it goes based on convention, essentially. It could allocate tons more memory, right? It doesn't, it doesn't change your program at all. Your program semantics are still fine. It's probably a little bit slower. Cool, good question. All right. So function frames are great, right? Absolutely necessary, one of the fundamental parts of writing recursive programs. Um, and so we can automatically it automatically allocates memory for us for the local variables, so we don't have to do that. Um, but there's other things we need when we call a function. So when you call a function, what are all the things that has to happen? So we talked about one of them, right? We talked about the return value. What are some other ones? Parameters, right? We have to pass parameters, right? What else? We're going to invoke some other function. Yeah. Callback location. Yeah. So, right? We're going to invoke some other function, which means we're letting the CPU start executing code at some other location. But presumably, we want that function to do something and then come back to us. Right? So, we need some way to say where to come back to. Uh, what about if we're using a base pointer, right? The base pointer. And they're a function, they're written, they're probably using a base pointer. to do their offset. And so we really need to, we need our frame pointer. We want to, we'll see, we need to have our frame pointer be the same when that function returns. The return address, right? And as we saw, the local variables and any temporary variables. So all of these things are stored on the stack for every function invocation, or can be, depending. So let's look at this. So this is where it gets into, oh, okay, I should have looked. Ahead. So the calling convention. So this is what specifies. So the idea is to invoke a function, right? We have to store all of that information. We have to store the parameters. We have to store the local variables. We have to store the the uh, the next return address, right? Of the where do we want that function to return to? We have to store our base pointer because that new function is going to use its own base pointer, right? So we need to make sure that doesn't get uh, clobbered. And so the calling convention basically 
establishes like who needs to who is in charge of storing that information, right? Does the caller do that, or does the function being called do that? The callee. Oh, so, short answer is both. So the convention dictates who does that. So the caller does some things, but the callee does other things. So, um, and so this is actually something that's really interesting uh, because it varies based on the processor. It, so in x86, uh, the convention is to use the stack to pass parameters. On ARM, the convention is to put uh, values in registers, to use the registers to pass parameters. Uh, but even not even thinking about the processor, it also based on operating system. So the Windows has a different calling convention than Linux. And then even on Linux, your Linux programs use the CDECL calling convention, which we'll see which is different than how you make function calls to the kernel with syscalls. So those are a different calling convention. Um, and so yeah, it could even depend on compiler or like type of call, like syscalls versus normal user function calls. And all this is is a convention, right? So the important thing is that you're, you're able to read this and understand this, and specifically you want to be familiar with the CDECL calling convention because this is the standard on x86 Linux. Um, so the way this works, the caller first pushes arguments onto the stack from right to left. So if you look at the stack and you go up the stack, the arguments will be left to right. And just how they are in the function call in C. So you put the rightmost one, you push that, and then push the second to the right, and then third to the right, so you've pushed all the arguments. So first is going to be all the arguments. Then the caller has to push the address of the instruction after the call, right? So this is gonna be stored on the stack so that that function knows where to return to, right? Because otherwise, it has no idea of how to get back to that function that called it. And so the callee, what it does at this point, right? The base pointer is still the caller's base pointer, right? EVP is still the caller's base pointer. So if the callee is going to use it, which for some purposes it may optimize out that it doesn't need to use a base pointer because there's no, maybe no local variables, right? Uh, so the callee can push the previous frame pointer onto the stack, then we'll create space on the stack for local variables. And then it has to ensure that the stack is consistent when it returns. Why is this? Why should it care? It's just doing its thing. that function push something onto the stack and then it calls a function, the stack has to be at that same place so it can pop what was on the stack off, right, and use it. Um, this is actually one of the key things, right, if you're ever uh, doing this by hand, right, you have to make sure your stack is consistent when you exit a function because otherwise all, everything goes crazy. And then finally it puts the return value into the EAX register. So this is how, this is how in C programs, return values are done, it's through the EAX register. So what does this mean when you call a function? What can you expect, can you, before you call a function as the caller, can you store some important information into EAX? No, because it's gonna get overwritten, right? Which is exactly what this says, is hey, this EAX register is gonna be overwritten. Furthermore, there's, I think there's probably a little bit more depth here because uh, just like with EAX, so the caller can or the callee can obviously overwrite EAX. And so I think for each register, it's defined if the callee has to save it before using it, so push it onto the stack and then use it, or if it can just use it directly. Um, I actually don't know it off the top of my head, but it's something to look up, and the compiler will handle all of those constraints. All right, so let's look at an example. So we have our function main, we have a variable A, and we are calling a function, passing it 10 and 40, and setting that return value to A, and then we're gonna return A. Then we have our function, call E, which is going to return A plus B plus one. Pretty simple, pretty simple program. So, our main function, so when we compile this, looking at the assembly, the main function is gonna look like this. It's gonna say push EVP, right, so this is, main is a function just like any other, right? So when it calls, 
At the start, it's the callee. So it needs to, if it wants to use a base pointer, it's got to save the base pointer. So here, by pushing the current value of EVP onto the stack, it's now saved the previous frame's base pointer. Then we're going to move the stack pointer into EVP, just like we saw. So we're setting up, OK, our base pointer is now where the stack pointer currently is. And now we're going to move the stack down here, hex 18. Then we're going to move 28. Oh, this is interesting. Yes, OK. So we saw this before that this was a local variable thing. But we'll see that this is a weird compiler option. Not, not weird, but this is a compiler optimization. So uh, it's actually moving the stack down so that it already has room for local variables and for uh, the <coughs> um, the parameters to this function call. Uh, so it's going to move 28. So it's hex 28. 40. It's going to move 40 to ESP plus 4. And then it's going to move hex 10, which is or hex A, which is 10 to ESP, right? So we have ESP plus 4 is above ESP. So here we have 40, 10. So it's in reverse order of, so it's pushed onto the stack from right to left. Um, so 40 is higher up on the stack, and 10 is lower down on the stack. And it's going to call call E, and then it's going to say, okay, you're going to do whatever you're going to do, uh, but I know when you return, you're going to put the return value to EAX, so I'm going to move EAX into EVP minus 4, which is going to be A, which we can infer is A. And then we're going to move EVP minus 4 into EAX. So why are we doing this step? Yeah, so we're returning it, right? So this is the return A, but this seems crazy, right? Moving it into the stack and then moving it from the stack back into EAX. So could it just optimize this out and say, just leave it in EAX and return? But you could do something else with your return value and then maybe return. You could do, but we don't do it here, right? Shouldn't it be smart enough? That's a tricky question. Yeah. So this EVP is the memory location and this EAX is the register. So you need to put that thing in the register and then taking into the memory loop. Yeah put this thing in the memory location and then taking again to the register for the addition. And ah, but we're not doing it's done with the addition, it's just put this So this is just the function main. So we're doing no addition here, right? If you look at the function main, there's no addition being done. So you're over here you're storing this thing in the EVP, but you're not changing the value of the EVP after the next step. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you're just storing this thing in the EVP. Yes, we're storing it onto the stack. We're at EVP minus four. And then we're taking what's in EVP minus four and putting it into EAX. So if you wrote it like that, then yeah, it, it would do that because it has no place to store it because there is no local variable. So it, it will output like that. But looking at the assembly code, you know as a human that you could optimize this by actually just removing these two lines. right? Because you know that callee is going to place a return value in EAX and you're never using it. So you could just delete those two lines. Right? Um, yeah. So like then I guess they are done this thing with due to the multiple processors sharing the same memory stack. So if there is a switch, yeah, context switch happens and the second processor, they might change the EAX value of the register. So very close. So on context switching, the, the OS stores all the values of the registers. You don't have to worry about your registers ever going away. But if we think about a multi-process environment, yeah. what if this A variable is being shared between two processes, right, with memory mapped between them? And then by not copying it back into there, that other process will never know that we changed that value, right? So we actually, by optimizing it out, we're changing potentially the behavior of the program. Now in this case, you could prove pretty conclusively that that's not going to happen in this program. Uh, but by default, that's why it doesn't do these kind of optimizations at the base default level, because it would rather be correct. Right? It's very clear that this maps very clearly to each line, and we know that that's correct, uh, as opposed 
opposed to applying the more aggressive optimizations that could change behavior. Yeah. Do the O optimizations actually improve this? Or? I don't know. I was actually thinking it'd be really interesting to look at that. Mm -hmm. And actually, on the, so this was on a set OS. 6.7 compiler, so on the latest Ubuntu GCC, it will probably generate different code, um, which is something I've seen, so, you know. And probably if you use Clang, it'll do something else, <laughs> even on simple, crazy examples like this. Um, so, okay, good. All right, so then we have, okay, then we have leave. So leave, the leave instruction is the exact opposite of the move ESP and the move stack pointer. Leave says, <coughs> wait, let me, okay, it's the opposite of these two lines, the first two lines. So leave is, so we have the base pointer, we have a stack pointer. So leave says, set the stack pointer to the current base pointer, right, which gets rid of all this subtraction, moves it back to where it was, and then it does pop EDP take that value that's on the stack, remember we stored EVP at the start, and put that into EVP, which is gonna be our caller's base pointer, which is gonna point somewhere else up on the stack. Right. And then return says, take the value on the stack and uh, jump to it, as we'll see. Uh, start executing from there. So, kind of a bit of important, I don't know, not super important, but a bit of terminology. So this part, right, is not actually part of the function. Right. This doesn't do any of the computation that the function needs to do. So we call this the function prologue, which is the part that's going to be essentially on every function that to set up and to take care of the calling convention. Uh, the same thing with the epilogue here. So this is the last part, right? It has nothing to do with the actual function itself, but it's important because it takes care of uh, all of the calling conventions. So if we look at callee, callee is going to do the same thing. It has its own epilogue or prologue. So it's going to push EVP, it's going to move the stack pointer to the base pointer, then it's going to move EVP now plus C, right, because from the base pointer, parameters are going to be above the base pointer, into EAX, it's going to move EVP plus 8 into EDX, <coughs> it's going to, this is an add, so the load effective address is going to take EDX plus EAX plus one, uh, and move that into EAX. Oh, no, that's right, okay, sorry. It's gonna do EDX, this is the indexing thing. So it's gonna do EAX times one plus EDX, and move that into EAX. And even though, super confusing, <coughs> even though there's uh, parentheses here, uh, there's no memory dereference, and that's what the load effective address means. Uh, so it's, which is also confusing, because you're not actually loading a memory address. So then we're adding one to that, so then we do that one, and then we pop EVP, which is the opposite here, and we return. So notice here we're not, we don't have any local variables, so we're not changing the stack pointer at all here. Right, so that's why there's no, no subtraction there. So here the prologue is a little bit smaller with a slightly, excuse me, slightly different epilogue. Okay, let's walk through this. So we have our callee, we have our main function. Now I need to know exactly where these, these instructions are going to be in memory, right? As we saw, all the code, all the data is gonna be in memory somewhere. So at runtime, these are gonna be given memory locations. Uh, actually at compile, well, at linking time, uh, if it's not a relocatable executable, it's gonna have fixed memory locations here. Uh, so every function in here is going to have them. This was just for my run. And actually kind of the interesting thing, you can see the difference between them is the size of each instruction. So we can see a push is just one byte, whereas a move ESP EVP is two bytes. Okay, so we have our stack. We have all the registers. So we start at the top. Let's say it's FD2D4. I think this was it when I ran it once. So the stack pointer is going to have the value FD2D4. We're going to start in main. So we're going to first push EVP. So there's, oh, and we know, so I have EIP here. So EIP points to the next instruction to be executed. Right, so this is how I know, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is push EVP. And when I do that, I'm going to take, let's say EVP is something 
this is supposed to be above us, right, higher than us. So it's, it's the base pointer of somebody else who called the function main. So we're going to first push that onto the stack, right, and the instruction pointer is going to change. So we've done that. We've pushed it onto the stack. So now that we've saved it, now we're free to overwrite EVP, right? We can put make our own base pointer. So now we're going to move the stack pointer into the base pointer. So now we have both of them pointing to this memory location, fd 2 d 0 Then we're going to subtract uh, hex 18 from the stack pointer. So now the base pointer points up to the top, and the stack pointer points hex 18 down. What's 18? 16 plus 8. What is it? 24. So it's going to move 24 characters down, or bytes down, sorry. Then we're going to move hex 28 to ESP, so ESP points right here, plus 4, so it's going to be here, right? So it's going to be ESP plus 4. So we're going to move hex 28 into there, and then we're going to move hex A or 10 into ESP. So now remember the calling convention said, hey, if we want to call a function and we want to pass parameters, we need to pass uh, our parameters were 10, 40, right? So the rightmost parameter needs to be pushed first, so this is 40, and the next parameter is 10, which is pushed second on the stack. So if we look at the stack of the arguments, right, if we go up, they're 10, 40, which is left to right, and if we go down, they're right to left, 40, 10. So we're in, we're currently here, the stack is in a good state to uh, call this function. So the call instruction says, an address. So it says start executing from, or set EIP to 804.83.94, which is the start of call E. Right? But it also has a side effect where it says also push the next instruction to be executed, which is 804.83.bf. And that way this function knows where to return to. Right? So it's going to first push that on there, and then it's going to call the function call E. So it's going to change the EIP. And this isn't really important, right? Because we're ceding control of our function to some other function, right? And that function has complete control of the CPU, but we want it to come back to us, right? We want it to do some kind of computation for us. Uh, I can't think of it as like, Han uh, shoot. You guys know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Kind of, sounds like four of you. Uh, great. Uh, so they're this horrible, horrible fairy tale, but the basic idea is these little kids like want to go exploring in the woods, right? So they took a loaf of bread and they left a trail of breadcrumbs, right, leaving their house. And that way, however far they got, they knew they could go home by following the breadcrumbs, right? Just like these addresses are the breadcrumbs of the functions to know how to get back. So we'll we'll revisit Hansel and Gretel's fate in a bit. Okay. So now we're in Kali, so we do the same thing, right? Now the base pointer is main's base pointer, right? But we're calling a new function, so we have to save that base pointer, right? So we're first going to push EVP, save that base pointer, and move the stack pointer into the base pointer. So now we're moving it, and so we're saying, OK, good, for Kali now, now we know this is the base pointer. So when we execute this code, every offset is going to be from this base pointer. But we can get back to it because we've stored it onto the stack. So then when we move EVP plus C, so EVP plus C is what? 1, 2, 3. It's going to be 28. Right, so which parameter number is this going to be? 40, the second parameter, right? And so see, the compiler knows because of the calling convention, hey, I know that after the base pointer, right at the base pointer is the saved base pointer, because I put that there. And then above that is the saved return value. And then above that is the first parameter. And then above that is the second parameter. So that's three up, one, one, two, three. So that's e, uh, EVP plus C to get to that second parameter. So it's going to move that into EAX. And so here we can see this is the function frame for main, and this is the function frame for call E. Right? And so as your program executes, every call right, is going to continually change this layout. 
So we're going to move uh, hex 28 into EAX. We're going to move A into EDX. We're going to add them together to get hex 32. Then we're going to add 1 to EAX. Now we're done. We've done all our computation. We've put the return value in EAX, right? Hex 33. Now we need to reverse the prolog. So we're going to pop the saved base pointer into the base pointer, right? Because we're setting up our caller's base pointer. So once I pop that, now my base pointer points up to the top. And I've popped, so I move that up. And now return says, Essentially, it's the same as pop EIP. So take the value that I'm currently pointing, the stack is currently pointing at, put that into EIP. Right? So it'll start executing from that value, and the pop moves the stack pointer. So when we do that, the stack moves up, and EIP becomes uh, 80483BF, which just happens to be the address, the next instruction in our main program. And EAX is happily now the value of what we want. So that's the only thing that changed, right? Our base pointer is still the same. We're executing right the next instruction. So to us, nothing happened, right? We just called some function, and it computed some value for us. So then we move EAX uh, into our local variable, into EBP minus 4. And now EBP is our EBP. And now then we move it back into EAX. We leave, which is going to set the stack pointer to the base pointer, which is going to move that up. So the stack pointer is now good. We've not changed the stack anymore. And then finally, we are going to, uh, oh, yeah, leave is uh, pop that. That's right. Move the stack pointer and then pop into e EBP. So that saved EBP we had, which was FD2C0, is now popped. So now our, the person who called us has their base pointer put back into place. Okay, cool. Does that make sense? Okay, this is critical. I know this is kind of uh, low level stuff, but it's actually very critical to understanding stack overflow vulnerabilities. So we're going to see how, as an attacker, we can take advantage of this in order to corrupt and change the control flow of the application.